Hello, I'm the awesome tutor, and we are returning again to Egypt, this time looking at Egypt as the Veiled Protectorate. You'll find out what that means sooner or later. Um, and we're going to look at the work of Sir Evelyn Baring. So, here are some key questions, which hopefully we'll be able to answer by the end of the video. Why did the British stay in Egypt after 1882? And what was the impact or success of Bering's reforms? So Egypt as the Veiled Protectorate. Now, the British said that the occupation was supposed to be temporary. We're not really ruling Egypt. Egypt is the province of the Ottoman Empire, not the British Empire. The, the Khedive is the one with the real authority. Okay, and Egypt has an independent military. We're not ruling Egypt. This is temporary. That's what they said. But in reality, okay, the British Consul General, in this case Sir Evelyn Baring, he had the dominance in the administration of Egypt. Okay, and in terms of the army, the British are the ones that, um, l that supervise the appointments in the army. Okay, so in reality, Egypt was a protectorate. De facto, it was a protectorate, but de jure, it was not. That's why it's called the Veiled Protectorate. Okay? And uh, if you want a funny statistic here, they had broken their promises of leaving Egypt 66 times in the space of 32 years. Now, Consul General Sir Evelyn Baring. Let's try and understand his character. He was paternalistic, patriotic, imperialist, um, one textbook described him as the classical example of a late Victorian imperialist. Okay, he was self-assured. Now, what was his view of the natives, the Egyptians? He thought they were inferior in comparison to the superiority of the Anglo-Saxons. Okay, he was convinced of his own righteousness, that he, that he knew what the Egyptians needed and he could provide that for them. So his aims. Now, if you're going to look at the successes of his reforms, you need to know the aims. What was he trying to do while he was there? He wanted to make fundamental changes in agricultural infrastructure, such as drainage improvements. He wanted to reform the administrative system and implement financial controls to deal with the debt. Okay. And he wanted to secure a financial footing for British interests. So his aims there were also strategic in the wider geopolitical game that the British Empire was playing. And so, Bering himself was a key factor in the continuation of the occupation, because reforms need time. The goal of the British in the area was to reform, so that was a key reason in why they stayed in Egypt. There are other reasons which I will cover in other videos relating to the problem of the Sudan. Okay, so let's look at Bering's reforms. He spent one million pounds on irrigation and trying to clean out the Nile's silted drainage canals. And you can see that he had such a heavy focus on agriculture. And this is exemplified in the fact that 8% of government revenue was spent on agriculture and hydraulic improvements under the Public Works Department. So his reforms did lead to increased efficiency and modernization in agriculture, but he was very constrained because his successes were highly limited by funding problems. If you recall from my previous video, Egypt was basically bankrupt in 1876 and was running up debts of up to 100 million pounds. So Bering also had to deal with the financial instability in Egypt, and that meant that more money went towards paying for debt than funding his agricultural reforms. Okay, But he was able to make do. In 1885, he went to the London Convention, and they agreed to give him a $9 million loan. But as you can see, most of that was spent on debt, whereas only a little portion of it was spent on actual agricultural policies. And in terms of taxes, 50% of the tax revenue was also spent on debt repayments. But he was actually pretty successful in solving these financial problems because he achieved solvency by 1887. 
solvency meaning that he was able to pay off all the debts. So debt was no more uh, a problem. So he did successfully um, implement financial controls and restored financial stability to the area. More reforms include um, the fact that he refused to fund secondary education and he also raised tuition fees in existing primary schools to decrease enrollment. Now, this has a lot to do with his ideology. He believed that if the Egyptians developed too fast intellectually, this would destabilize society. Okay, so uh, he was fearing that as they got more intelligent, they would be more prone to dissent and revolt. And he also argued that involvement in education was not the responsibility of the governing class. So, yeah, um, education was extremely hindered by Bering's reforms. And so you end up with lots of angry Egyptians as a result of Bering's reforms and his imperialist mindset. So you have two factions, the ruling classes and the fellahin, also known as the peasant classes. Okay, if you want to impress the examiner with your terminology, say fellahin instead of peasant classes. So the Khedive Abbas Hilmi, the successor to Khedive Tufik Pasha, he conspired with intellectuals like Mustafa Kamil, funding his trip to France in order to influence foreign opinion against British rule. Now, if you look at the peasant classes, well, Bering's educational reforms definitely uh, put a limit on their class mobility. And the peasants had a higher tax burden than the larger landowners. And this was to do with um, the way that Bering implemented his financial reform, specifically tax collection, okay? The haraj tax, which was the tax on peasant-owned land, was one pound, six shillings, and four pence per fedin. Fedin is a, a unit of measurement. It closely resembles one acre. The usher tax was the tax on the lands owned by the large landowners, so ten shillings and seven pence per fedin. So, what Bering was trying to do by making these taxes different was he was trying not to upset the large landowners who had a lot of political influence in the area. Because if he upset them, then that would lead to destabilization and political instability. They might dissent, they might revolt, and so he tried to placate the large landowners, but in the process he alienated the peasant classes. And so what this did is you end up with rising nationalist sentiment against the British among all layers of society. Not just in the peasant classes, but also the ruling classes. Because as I said, Egypt was the veiled protectorate. They kept promising to leave, but they did not. And they held true dominance in the administration, not the Khedive. So, how far were Bering's reforms successful? Well, did, did he achieve his aims? Yeah, he mostly achieved his aims. Uh, changes, in, changes in agricultural infrastructure, he did that. He reformed the administrative system and, implement, and implemented financial controls, reaching solvency by 1887. He secured a financial footing for British interests. But what was the impact of his reforms? The impact was very detrimental. This has been The Awesome Tutor. Bye. Thank you.